Jeremiah 14. Let's turn there. I got one verse up on the screen, but let's get the context of it. Uh, Jeremiah 14. We're dealing with types of spirits. Um, <clears throat> because the Apostle Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians 11, he warns us of another spirit. How do, I, how do we identify the real spirit from a false spirit? People don't know this. People don't read their Bibles. They just take... They just take whatever the church they go to deals out to them, and that has to be accepted as true. And woe be to the person who questions this with the Word of God. One man I know was at a uh, particular church where the women were all speaking, and they were all talking in unknown languages. And he read, he called me, I showed him in the Scriptures, he read the scriptures, believed the scriptures, went to his pastor with the scriptures, with what the Bible said. If any man speaking an unknown, let it be by unknown tongue, let it be by two or at, or at the most three, and that by course. In other words, one after another. And then right and then let one interpret. Then right after that, let all your women be silent in the church. So he went to his pastor with first Corinthians fourteen pastor told him that was for them in that time during that day it doesn't have anything to do with us now in other words we don't care what the Bible says we're gonna do what we feel like we're, we're gonna do and so that was it for him he's he left he's out he's not gonna do it anymore one pastor telling his youth pastor you can't use that King James in our church anymore I thought I told you that. Don't ever use that Bible in this church ever again. That was it for him. He's done. If we're not going to believe the Bible, what are, we, what are we doing? What are we here for? So, the Spirit, you recognize the Spirit by its relation to the written Word of God. If it will not abide by the Word of God, then it is, it's real simple, it is not the Spirit of God. This is how you test the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. But then having a little knowledge on top of that never hurts somebody. In Jeremiah 14, let's look at verse, let's look at verse 13 to get the context. Um, verse 13, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold the prophet say unto them, ye shall not see the sword, Neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. What does that sound like to you? What does that sound like? If you were to take verse 13 and apply it in modern, if you were to look around in the modern uh, military industrial church complex, how would you see verse 13 fitting in with what you see coming out of some churches? Huh? Everybody, there's, there's, no, there's no sword for you. You're never going to see famine. All you have to do is proclaim wealth and speak faith-filled words. And if you do that, then you'll never be, you'll never be without, right? You'll never lack anything. So all you've got to do is speak the words, and it'll come to you. And if it doesn't happen, if what she say doesn't work for you, what is their response to that? Huh? Obviously, you didn't do enough. Obviously, you're holding back from God, or you don't have enough faith, or it's all, basically, it's your fault why it didn't work. Because if you didn't, if you didn't say the right words, or say them the right way, or have the right mental attitude along with them, if you didn't do that, then obviously, God cannot give you these things. Obviously, you're going to be in famine, because, and it's your fault you, it didn't happen that way. That's what they lay on people. They lay burdens upon them, making them perform, 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 and perform, perform, and then lie. Because if you're sick, you cannot ever say the words, I'm sick. You cannot say that. You must say, I am not sick in Jesus' name. No sickness abides in me. And what that is, is a lie. You're lying. You're, and the, but they're telling you those are the, the positive words that you must speak. 
And if you don't speak those positive words, if you speak negative words, of course you're going to be sick. And here again, it's your fault that you're sick. It's your fault that you couldn't make these devils go out of you. It is all your fault that you couldn't perform well enough to, um, to impress God so he could release wellness unto you. He could deliver you from these devils and so on and so on. So, verse 14. God's going to show Jeremiah, thus show us, what's going on. Then said the Lord unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them, that they prophesy unto you a false vision and divination. Spirit of divination. And a thing of naught, and the deceit, of their heart. People ask me, do, do people like Joyce Myers and somebody, do they really believe what it is they're saying or do they know that they are purposely lying to people? That's a good question. My guess is they really believe it. They're deceived because obviously it works for them because they're filthy rich. Well, they're filthy rich because they conned you into writing a check for two or three thousand dollars at a time. They conned you into it. Okay? They told you that the more, the higher check you write, that shows the greater faith you have. Now what happens is, some of these people that are writing a check for five thousand dollars do not have five thousand dollars. They're going into debt, five grand. They're borrowing, they're writing it off a credit card or off of whatever, but they're writing a, a check of $5,000, even though they don't have $5,000. Now Joyce has their $5,000, but it's not their $5,000. It's the bank's $5,000. But the bank is not going to come after Joyce for the money. They're going to come after the person that wrote it who was told that if they write it, they would get something back in return, and they're not getting anything back. They're going to have to pay that bill, or they're going to have to cancel the debt somehow, me making them a thief. They stole money thinking that God was going to give them money to cover the debt, and God didn't give them anything, and they're going to have to default on the loan, and Joyce has got the money, their, their credit is ruined, they stole five grand and gave it, to, gave it to Joyce. That's all that is. That's all that is. It's like the casinos getting the permission years ago to have... Uh, loan machines in the lobby of the casino. Stupidest thing you can imagine. People get in that building, lose all their money, but think they're on a roll. Think that the next roll of the dice is going to, they're going to hit it big. They go out in the lobby, borrow $10,000, lay it all on the table, and walk out there $10,000 in debt that they got to pay. Verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall these prophets be consumed. And to the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach, with their very grievous blow. In other words, she was wounded physically and spiritually. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. And if I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they knew not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Hath thy soul low Zion? Why hast thou smitten us? And there is no healing for us. We look for peace and there is no good. And for the time of healing, and we behold trouble. These, these people, both man and woman, they receive something to them and they pass it on. They say it's of God, but it's not. It is a spirit of divination. And a spirit of divination every now and then will be right. It will create a situation where 
the, the spirit itself is going to perform something that it knows is going to happen in the future. They'll give that to a prophet or a priest. They'll give it to a man or a woman of God and say, say this to them and I'm going to make it happen 3.30 tomorrow afternoon. And then lo, behold, it happens and that just buries them further into believing the prophet or the man or the woman. Once they have their hooks into them, they can prophesy all they want to and they say things that are not of God and yet these people believe it because they were right one time. And yet... The Bible gives you the idea that they have to be right every time, if they're wrong one time. If somebody told me something that was going to happen and it didn't happen, I don't listen to them ever again. You get one chance, one chance to be wrong. And if you're wrong one time, according to God, I don't listen to you anymore. And I heard back, all the way back in 2000, prophets and prophetesses prophesying that the year 2000 was going to be terrible. It's going to be the, a, the time of the tribulation. It's got the Jacob's trouble. It's going to happen in 2000. There's going to be famines and wars everywhere simply because the computer chip couldn't count to 2000. And they predicted all of this terrible, terrible thing happening. And nothing happened. Well, I won't say nothing happened. One thing happened. One thing. Pre- carved tombstone. Man and woman purchase a tombstone. The woman dies 1985. They expect the man to die before 1999. So they carve out the tombstone. Uh, she died 1985. He was born 1901, lived until 19 blank to save money. So that when it came time that he died, all they had to do was carve in two numbers. Well, he didn't die in 1999. So now he got a tombstone with his death on there as 19... And how do you erase that? It's carved in stone. You can't erase it. You can't chip it out. You, obviously something was there. Somebody made a mistake. That was the biggest problem that they faced when the year 2000 rolled around was all these tombstones with 19 carved in it and the person didn't die when they were supposed to. Okay? So, yeah, it's truth. So, I don't know what all the... I don't know if they came up with some epoxy to put in to fill in the gaps or what. But obviously, or put maybe some kind of brass marker there or something like that. Brass plate or what? Cover it up. Cover it, but the mistake had to be covered up somehow, some way. But none of this stuff happened in the year 2000. And then... Stan Johnson, the Prophecy Club, because he, his ministry took a hit after 2000 because he made all these predictions about Y2K and none of it happened. And you know what happened? I quit listening to him. And so did a bunch of other people. And they quit donating. And he's whining and complaining. And I said to him, Stan, don't you think these guys, when they were wrong about Y2K, that people quit listening? And he made a radio show that said, it's possible that a man of God can be wrong and yet still be a man of God. No! No! And he used Jonah as the illustration. See, see, God didn't destroy Nineveh. Jonah was wrong. Jonah was not wrong. Jonah said, except ye repent. What happened? They repented. God's word then did not fail. They repented and God stayed his destruction of Nineveh. Okay? He's not, God's not wrong and he's not going to be wrong. Amen? Spirits will be wrong one time. All it takes. Okay? So a spirit of divination, when these people say things and they don't take place. But the biggest thing here, what he's telling you is that you're right. These spirits of divination will be in these false prophets telling you everything is okay with you. You, can, you don't even have to be a Christian in Joel Osteen's mindset for you to put in place the faith principles that he tells you to put in place. You can still be wealthy and healthy and not even be saved according to him. And they tell you that the sword and the famine, the sword represents warfare, famine represents decrease of finances and, and misery and then all the things that go along with that including diseases. They tell you that these things will never happen to you if you just do what they tell you to do. 
and millions of people all over the world, billions of people all over the world are doing these things, and yet these things are happening to them, and they still follow that same false prophet. There's one in Kenya, Prophet Owar. Goes around telling everybody he's some great prophet of the Lord, that when he speaks, God is always speaking through him. He pretends to manifest signs and wonders. He uses Photoshop on his website to Photoshop signs and wonders in the heavens of what happened while he was speaking, and yet nobody remembers them happening, and he deceives people. And we've got preachers that have told our radio station guys that they quit following prophet of war, and they're going to start reading their Bibles from now on. Keep it up. The only sure way, you think, the only sure thing that we have, the only sure word that we have is this Bible. And it's never, ever wrong. Ezekiel 12, turn there. A different kind of divination. Think about this. This is the one I was going to follow. Years, years ago. Ezekiel 12. Thank you folks for praying for me. I went uh, Thursday from having no voice to Friday being sick to my stomach. Friday and Saturday being sick to my stomach. But then I feel better today. I got my voice back. Amen. Ezekiel 12. Let's look and uh, let's start in verse 21. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel saying, The days are prolonged and every vision faileth. Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease. They shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every, every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision, nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. Flattering divination. Flattering in that they're going to say things that are meant to elevate you. To flatter you. Say good things about you. Positive things about you. There are, and Joyce teaches this, and I heard a, a young lady, I won't say who it was, because they're related to somebody in this church. That's how I heard it. There was a young lady that used to work for Joyce Myers. And a lot of people in this area are people who used to work for Joyce Myers. And they'll tell you the same thing. She is not, in real life, who she pretends to be on camera. She is a completely different kind of you-know-what, okay? And the people that work for her have been ingrained with these ideas that if they say negative things, then negative things happen. But if they say positive things, then only positive things will happen. And I heard her in a waiting room at a hospital, say something, and she said, oh, that's negative coming out of my mouth. I shouldn't say things like that. I'm going to say positive things from here on, and I'm just going. But it's this flattering divination, this flattering thing whereby preachers or the prophets, they tell the people, don't ever say anything negative. So what I'm going to say about you is, you are good, you are wealthy, you are healthy, you are a wonderful person. You have a great personality. Everybody around you just gravitates to you because they love you, because they want to be like you. I'm going to say those things to you, and I'm going to say them in every sermon, and in every teaching is all going to be centered around what I'm going to say positive about you. Because I have been taught by these people that if I say negative, if I preach the truth, like if I say you are a hell-deserving, rat-bag, dirty, scumhead sinner going to hell. If I say that, obviously he's going to hell. Okay? A story I heard, cannot verify if it's true or not, but I heard it. A man was uh, being asked, he was being uh, looked into for being a youth pastor of a very large ministry. And this man was, I mean, he was excited about it. And he was one of the top candidates. And as he's being interviewed, he's being told, now, if you accept this position, 
There are things, there are guidelines that you must follow when you teach, when you preach to these young people. You cannot mention hell, sin. You cannot mention uh, total depravity of, of people. You cannot mention certain things. And the meaning is, by mentioning, if I say you are going to hell, I have just cursed you and you're going to hell no matter what. Because I said it. I said negative things. I said sin. And there's a reason why you will not hear some of these TV guys say the word hell. They believe that if they say it, that they are cursing people to go to hell. My friends, you're already cursed. You're going to hell. You were born that way. You were born with the curse of Adam upon you. You're going to hell. You need a Savior to save you out of it. You cannot save yourself with positive words. That is a, that is a flattering divination. Telling people what they want to hear and for the most part, lost people who will not go to a church that tells them they're going to hell, that tells them that uh, shacking up is wrong, that tells them that things that people are doing are immoral and wrong and listening to this and watching this and being a part of this lifestyle. You cannot do that. They will not go to this church because they go to the positive church that will never tell them these things. And they're full. Their Sunday school classes are full all over the world, all over this country. And that is a spirit that gets in these people that will not allow them to speak what this book says. It only allows them to speak positive, healthy, good, flattering words to people to get them accepted. And a long time ago, I was thinking, well, that's the only way to reach people is to be nice to them. So I'll just be nice to everybody. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Amen? Somebody, at some point, has to tell you the truth. Somebody does. So, I know some people don't like Judge Judy. I like her. Even though she's a Jew and she's lost, she needs to be saved. I like her because she doesn't have a problem telling people what they need to hear. You're a moron, sir. You're an idiot. You're a moron. Get out of my courtroom. You can try that with everybody else. You can overtalk everybody else to get your way, but you're not going to overtalk me. And she nails some of these people. She sees them in about two minutes, what kind of person they are, what character they have, and how they like to rule the roost. And she says, you're not, this is my courtroom. You're not going to do that here. I'm in charge. You have to listen and be under my authority for a change. I like it. She gets paid well to do this. Okay? The, the enticement for those to go into her courtroom is, I don't know if you know this, if she judges against them and they have to pay $5,000, $5,000 is never going to leave their wallet. They're paid out of what they would have been paid to be on that show. Now, to be on the show, they get nothing. This is what makes them mad. Okay? They thought they were going to win and get all that money. Said they lose, and now they don't get any money. It's just that they don't have to pay the money. That's pretty good, isn't it? So everybody takes a chance and go into her courtroom thinking maybe they can get that money but instead, they walk out of there with nothing, and it makes some people mad. Ezekiel 13, related to that. Turn to Ezekiel 13. There is, what do we say? False vision and divination. There is flattering divination. There is lying divination. Ezekiel 13. Let's pick it up. Let's go to verse 3. Thus saith the Lord. You know what? Let's go back to verse 2. Son of man, prophecy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. What is wrong with a preacher preaching out of his own heart? What is wrong with that? What did you say? He always had a jaded view. What did you say? The heart of man is desperately deceitful and wicked above all things. So to speak out of our own heart 
It is desperately wicked and it is deceitful and my heart will deceive you. That's my human flesh. That's my human nature. It is deceived. It is to try to gain some sort of advantage over you. It is to make you think that if you don't hear it from me, you, don't, you won't get it. If you don't get it from me, you won't get it. This is why I won't say things that are in the Bible. Because if I said everything that was in the Bible, then you, could, you know that you could just go to the Bible and read it for yourself and you don't need me. But it's this idea that you, don't, you can't get what you need to get from God. You must get it from, thee, from me. That makes me a very valuable person in your life, which means that if I say that you need to give more or you can't receive, then you're going to give and keep giving and keep giving because I won't give you unless you give me. That's, that's the nature of it. And it's not just in charismatic churches. It's in Baptist ones. It's in uh, non-charismatic uh, churches, like churches of God. It is, it is in every denomination. It is in every mindset of, of a man who will not adhere to the Word of God. He will tell people that they can only, or he will give them the idea that they must get it from him or they're not going to get it. And if he can convince enough people that it's that way, then when it comes time for his salary increase, he can name his salary or leave because he's got other churches that want him to go there. He can name his own price. He can get what he wants because he is a very valuable person in that church and they need, they say, we need you here. No, you don't. You don't need me. You don't need anybody to tell you what God can tell you for free inside of your Bible. Raise your hand if God has ever shown you something out of that Bible that I have not said. But raise your hand. You don't need me. You don't need me. Now, I'm here because I like to wake everybody up to the Word. Hey, read your Bible! Because we all need that. Amen? But as far as getting something from God... You have just as much right to read your Bible as I do. Or let me say that way. You have just as much to read the Bible on your own as you do for me to read the Bible to you. Okay? You get it from God, praise the Lord. You get it from God, it'll last longer. But they've seen a lying vanity. Vanity. There it is right there. It means I'm going to give you something that's going to last a year or two, and after a while it's going to be gone. Or I'm going to try to get a response out of you. This is why. If, you ever, if you've ever asked the question, why doesn't he have an uh, altar call after every service? It's because, and this is just me, but I was fixated on the altar call. It's one of my weaknesses. I was trying to preach and design a sermon to get... A response. And I was always in a very bad state of mind, personally, because I was afraid that I hadn't performed well enough to get somebody to the altar that time. Because I've seen big altar calls. And that makes me want big altar calls. And God has, I guess, delivered that, delivered me from that in that I'm not interested anymore in a quick response from somebody. Not. That's vanity. Because how many people, Sterling, have we seen make a very quick decision, come here, and then an even quicker decision to never come back again? What good did it do that I got them to the altar? It's like churches bragging about how many people that they got saved or that they baptized. What difference does that make? If I believe that you just come to the altar and you getting in the water saved you, then I could boast about it. But I don't believe that. I don't believe that you coming to an altar and you getting in the water gives you everlasting salvation any longer than you putting a lot more money than somebody else did. I don't believe that. The everlasting salvation is what God does in somebody. It's not what they do to get it. Okay? So, if I feel led to have...
altar call is because I think there's some burdens on some people. Let's pray and let's get them out with God. I am more interested to see you here a year and five years and ten years from now than I am for to see you come down one time and then never see you again. That's what I, that's what I care about. And so I can, I can be full of vanity and preach vain things. Or I can just simply teach and preach what I feel like God is telling me to do and then I want to see that work in you for a long, 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 long time. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Now, I want to say this to you. There will be people who will believe in nonsense like name, name health, get health. Name wealth, get wealth. They will be taught to believe it. Although they themselves privately have uh, doubts about it. Because so far it's not working in them. And so they will lay a burden upon you. A burden such as, oh you're sick? Well, if you will just name the sickness and claim it in Jesus' name and have it delivered from you, then there's no reason why you should be sick. What they're hoping is, is that you'll do what they tell you to do and it works for you so they can say, it does work. That's what that says. They've made others to hope that they would confirm the word. What I want you to do is I want you to send me checks and checks and money orders and large amounts of money. That way I can say, you know what, it does work. Look at all the money I've received. While you are in debt, you're in poverty. What ticks me off, what ticks me off, is when I see some of these guys like Peter Popoff, who has been exposed as a fraud, so he's decided he cannot go to middle class uh, people anymore, middle and upper class people anymore, he goes for poor people. He goes after poor, poor people, filling them with this idea that all they have to do is give money to him and they'll be rich. And it angers me that he's going after poor people and convincing them that they can be wealthy just like him, but he convinces them in the way where he says, when you re give it to me, when you send me all this money, then God will pour wealth out upon you. He walks away with their hard-earned money or money that they didn't earn, that they went in debt over, or money that they needed to pay for medicine, he walks away with and they have nothing. But he tells them it should work for them, and if it doesn't work for them, obviously it's their fault they're doing something wrong. That angers me. We're supposed to preach the gospel to the poor and not ask for anything. They're poor. And we're supposed to preach it to them in such a way as let them know that just because they're poor, the gospel that you want is absolutely free. And you don't need money for it. And poor people don't mind having something for free. Amen? Don't bother them a bit. That's that lying divination. And they have, sent, they have said that the Lord saith and the Lord hath not sent them. And again, the easiest way to discern whether or not God said what they said is to do what? Easy. Let me ask the question again. Focus now. The easiest way to find out whether or not what they said came from God is to do what? Check the Bible. If they read scripture to you and let it go, maybe God said that. I would then go back to the scriptures and ask God, God, is, are you saying this to me right now? Because God may, that's true, the truth of God, but it, God may not be working that in you at this time. Maybe a piece of DNA that God's not ready to manifest in your life. Okay? So you go read it, and then you go ask God. God doesn't have a problem with you going, to, going around the man's back and saying, God, is this for me? Okay? Show me. And God will show you. God will show you in His Word. God, listen, you're a child of God. He's not going to... Dema make demands. He's not going to make excessive demands out of you that he knows that you cannot fulfill. You're a child, remember? There are things that you can and cannot do. And it's just like us with our children. We don't demand. I not, was not asking Caleb to go start the car when he was eight. 
Now that he's 14, he can start the car. And that's it. Don't, Caleb, don't put it in gear. Dad, Dad, can I pull... He's, he's all the time on me. Dad, can I pull this the rest of the way up the driveway? No. But why, Dad? You see all these cars and houses and innocent people? Wait. God's the same way. He's not going to pile something on you that he knows that you cannot fulfill. Okay? So, if you're going to confirm any word, confirm here. Next time you testify, let me tell you what God did. I was reading this, and God did this in my life. Amen? All right. Uh, let's go to Spirit of Bondage very quickly. I'm trying to move through this and get to the gospel by next Sunday. Okay? Romans chapter 8. A spirit of bondage. Verse 15. For if you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Anytime you have a, you have not, you don't have this, but you have this. Anytime you have that in the Bible, where you have a clear distinction between two things, think Old Testament and New Testament. Because now we've gone from death to life. We've gone from bondage. When we were in bondage, when we were lost, we were under the law of the Old Testament. We were under the condemnation, and God was going to make us accountable for every law that we broke. But now that God has adopted us as His sons, we've gone from death, Old Testament, to life, New Testament. So when He says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, that's the Old Testament. But have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's the New Testament, because now God has given us the spirit of His Son in us, and God is no longer this way distant God that we cannot see up on top of Mount Sinai. He's our Father. We have a new birth in us. He is the God that now can be heard from and approached by way of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's how we can get to God. We don't want God to not talk to us anymore. Uh, Hebrews tells us, For we have not come to the mountain that cannot be touched, meaning Mount Sinai, but we've come to Mount Zion, the holy city, New Jerusalem, and to a, and to a, a, a covenant that speaks better things than the Mount Sinai covenant, but to a better blood, to a better covenant, to better promises, with better speech to it. You can understand the Bible now when you read the New Testament. Amen? That's what it is. Bondage means... You don't understand it. You're still under it. You're never going to get out away from it. And you're always going to be in bondage trying to attain the perfection that according to God in the Old Testament, He tells you you must attain to. You're always trying to reach that. Martin Luther. Martin Luther was reading Romans. And he was angry. He was reading Romans 8. And he was angry. He was angry at God. Because here he was, a Catholic monk, cloistered. Meaning, he didn't have much contact with the outside world. He sat inside that monastery, and he prayed, and he read the Latin Bible, and he flagellated himself, meaning he took whips and beat himself. Every time he had a lustful thought, BAM! He would whip himself with whips because he was told that's what had to be done in order to drive those evil thoughts out of his mind. And so he would whip himself. And for a while, he wouldn't have those thoughts. And then they'd come back on him again. And here he was, a monk, not even looking at women. There's no women to look at, and he's still having the thoughts. He beats himself again. And he's reading Romans 8, and he sees the righteousness of God, and he's angry at God. God, how dare you? How dare you demand of me that I attain to your righteousness when I have done everything I know how to do and I've never attained it. How dare you do that to me? He was in bondage, wasn't he? And then the Holy Ghost went... Phew. Now he's reading Romans again and he gets it one day. Because it's not the righteousness that he has to attain to. It's the righteousness that Christ already did. And he places himself in Christ, and now he has the righteousness of God dwelling in him. And he is no longer 
in bondage. This is why he can stand up to the Roman Catholic Church who has him on trial. And he can say to them, uh, I'm not under you guys any longer. I've been made free. There's a spirit of freedom and liberty in me. And you can do to me what you want to do to me. But I realize now that I have received the righteousness of God by nothing but His grace toward me. Because I believe what God said in Romans. And I believe what God said in His Word. You can do with me whatever you want to do with me. But I'm not under you anymore. That's freedom. That is freedom. You can be in jail and be free with that. Paul was. Silas was. They was all in jail. And they were singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. My goodness, it's a past quarter till. Mm. No more spirit of bondage. Amen. Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if the children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be, we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. So what is a little suffering? What is a little suffering in comparison to the glory that awaits us? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for making us free from all these spirits, spirits of divination, spirits of bondage. God, when we have your Holy Spirit, when we have your word, God, we are free people. And the devil cannot put us in bondage ever again. God, help, help the people that I speak to not be in bondage anymore, but be free. God, it bothers me when I see people that I love back under bondage again. It bothers me. God, it's just, I just pray, God, that you'd deliver us all from that bondage. Thank you, dear God, for your word. We love you. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, Amen.